Welcome everyone and happy Friday. Um, welcome to Business Basics Friday. I am Safi Russell, CEO and founder of SDR Consulting Inc. And on this Friday, our goal is to provide value to small business owners, sharing information and tools that um, you know, may be helpful, helpful to you. A little background about myself. I've been in the industry about 19 years and I'm a CPA and enrolled agent based in New York, but I do have a virtual practice. So we do work with clients all over. And uh, we mostly work with small business owners, helping them from business formation all the way through to tax preparation and all that fun stuff in between. And so today we have our guest speaker, Angie Tony, who's a CPA, and is going to cover a little bit about how to pay less taxes with proper tax planning. So Angie, floor is yours. And thank you again for joining us. Oh, thank you for having me. I am Angie Tony, owner of Angel Financial Services. I too am virtual. I've been a CPA over 20 years, but we know credentials mean nothing if you're not educated and versed in tax codes and taking the proper training, which I can say I do. I love to share the knowledge with the people because that's ultimately why we're here. Now, tax planning is interesting. A lot of people don't really do it, especially, well, the wealthy do it, right? But many people, taxpayers don't even know it's a thing. And a lot of us are historical. Whatever happened to us for the year, uh, you know, just go about our day. We get our W-2s mostly, and then we file a tax return at tax time, and it is what it is. We never think there's anything we can do about it. But we're here to tell you, you can be a little bit more proactive, right? What does that mean? I want people, the first thing I give is homework. You need to pull out the last tax return you've prepared, hopefully it was 2020, and if not, 2019, fine. Whatever you have, I want you to pull out that tax return and start going through it. I want, to, want you to understand, did you owe or did you, did you get a refund and why? And that's what a lot of people don't do. And I'm gonna tell you, I've had you know clients this year tell me that when I start educating them about their tax return, they didn't even know why it turned out the way it did or they may have saw that um, the prior preparer didn't take a particular deduction that they thought they were entitled to or and so on and so forth. So if you're not doing that, that's the basic of tax planning in general, just to understand your tax return and making sure you're taking all the deductions to which you're entitled and uh, take all the credits because this is called tax avoidance and tax avoidance is legal. Tax evasion, that's the one you don't want where you have to make up stuff. But we're here to tell you that there's no need to make up stuff. There's plenty of loopholes, credits, deductions, or you know, viable things that you can take and be audit proof because that's what it's there for. You're supposed to minimize your tax liability to the best of your ability. And when you work with a qualified professional, you will get that. Now, when you take this tax return, and you go through it, I want you to look at where the income is coming from. Line one, wages, right? And then you're looking at your dividends, your capital gains, maybe. Maybe some of you have a small business or rental property. This is where the income is coming from. And I want you to kind of say, okay, that makes sense. Look at all where it came from. Did you get a 1099 reporting that? And all these other um, tax documents that make up this number. And that's one way to feel comfortable that, okay, I've reported all that I needed to report. And then if you met, left something off, you may have gotten something called a CP2000. It's a notice from the IRS saying, hey, you left off so-and-so. And a popular one is the HSA. A lot of people have an HSA account. This is a, a, a medical uh, reimbursement account of some sorts. It's a savings that you get together mostly out of your W-2 job and you contribute to it. And then when you use it for qualified medical expenses, it's tax-free. But some people, when you get the distribution, you'll get a 1099 SA and you left it off the tax return. So what does this have to do with tax planning? Well, I need you to understand that this is money that is never taxed, right? It goes in tax-free, it grows tax-free. And when you use it for qualified medical expenses, it's tax-free. So part of the planning is to make sure that you are maximizing that, that strategy if it's available to you. And how, you, how do you get it? Well, you have to have a high deductible health plan. 
So in this particular presentation, I'm not going to go overly technical and into each and every single one of these strategies because it's only going to confuse you and we just don't have the time for that. But <clears throat> I wanted to put that one out there because it's very popular for everybody, your business owners, as well as the wage earners. And that's one that's often overlooked because people just don't understand it. They'll do the FSA. So if you have an FSA, flexible spending account, you may want to from a planning standpoint, look to see if you qualify for an HSA and do that one instead. The FSA, if you don't use it, you lose it. The HSA goes with you all the way into retirement. You wanna max that instrument out as much as possible because it's money that is virtually never taxed, totally tax advantaged. Um, and then one thing I do wanna say about it, when you turn 55, you get an extra thousand catch up. And if you have a spouse, that spouse gets an extra thousand catch up. You can't catch up in the same account though, because the one account is in one social security number. You have to open your own. So hello, I don't mind sharing the fact that I turned 55 earlier this year. And yes, you better believe I opened my own HSA account and start, yes, I am 55. <laughs> going to be 56 in January, but you know, that's okay. You know, I've, you know, earned what I've earned and a lot of lessons and being able to take them, take advantage of all of these strategies. Some people can also as wage earners max out their 401k. I'm not a fan of maxing out and you can ask me later why, but I, I don't believe people should put in more than the company match on, because there's so many other places to put your money that I think are, are advantageous to you rather than um, put deferring it all until retirement. Uh, if you've done everything else, then yeah, then I can see going back to that and then further deferring if you don't need the money. But that's another one wage earners can do. We probably are ending open enrollment, <clears throat> excuse me, in many companies right now. So you may you have to act fast if you want that HSA. If not, then leave that alone. That's for uh, the following year. You may have to look at that. Or if you're a small business owner, open it up uh, elsewhere. So that is one. So healthcare uh, are items that you will wanna look at for from a tax planning standpoint. Now, if you are a small business owner, there are some other healthcare things you can do. If you notice on your schedule A, if you have medical, dental, any kind of healthcare costs that you can deduct on a Schedule A, but guess what? Limited uh, over the last couple of years, 7.5%. So any of your AGI, anything over that, that's when you can start deducting. But then, you know, usually you don't have that big of expense. But if you have a small business, there's something called a Section 105. You will want to get back with Safi with or your professionals to see, hey, do I qualify for this? Yes, for a small amount of annual fee, you set up this reimbursement arrangement in your company where things that are not covered by health insurance can now come out of your small business. You take that deduction and guess what? It lowers your profit, which then lowers your taxes, uh, including self-employment tax. So that's one you will want to look at. When you're doing the tax planning, again, you're going through the tax return, you're analyzing, you're looking where your income is coming from. Is there any way I can lower these numbers legally, meaning find some credit deduction or something to lower that income, and now the tax is lowered. So that's the income part. Let's talk about the expense part and the deduction part and the credit part. So you will now look at your schedule one. Go to your schedule one and look at the bottom half of that schedule where you have adjustments to income. And some of the things are like, the HSA, as I was saying. So if you're not in a W-2 job and you're outside of that and you buy your insurance from the marketplace, let's say, and you contribute on your own, you want to make sure that you're deducting it on this schedule one and tell your professional that you contributed. You'll give them the form that shows that and they'll make sure you get that. There's self-employed SEP IRA, simple qualified plans can go in there. Self-employed health insurance deduction. I've had clients, believe it or not, who are small business owners who get their insurance from the marketplace, et cetera, paying you know, thousands of dollars a year and don't take the deduction. If you're an S corp, it's a little trickier. You have to figure out how that's um, to be done, but it needs to show up in box one 
of your W-2, because remember, you should be on payroll, join payroll from your S-Corp, and then now you can take the dedu deduction or adjustment on your 1040. Again, talk to your preparer and they'll show you how to do that. So again, I want you to go through all of those. Maybe you had student loan interest deduction. A lot of us are over the threshold, some things, but you know, still worthy to look to make sure, you know, tuition, things that you're taking to improve yourself in your business, those are deductions. So again, this tax planning is about having a professional go through the return, go through the prior three years is ideal, but even just the last one, go through it and see, did you miss anything? Are there any deductions that you could have taken or qualify for, or even plan to if you missed it, if you're not doing the right things to get that deduction? A great one is if you have a small business, <clears throat> excuse me, and you have children, <clears throat> of course the fraud would come now, and you have children below the age of 18, you can hire them in your practice because you know what? They are your dependents, right? They're, they're below a certain age where they may not have to pay FICA. If the parents own the business, this is in a partnership and it's both parents or one parent or the sole proprietorship owned by the parent and you hire underage children, guess what? They're in your, a lower tax bracket, probably a zero tax bracket, and you're going to hire them. And if you pay them below the standard deduction, which I think for 2021 is 12,550, and you pay them below that, guess what? They don't have to file. You don't have to withhold taxes and you still get to claim them as a dependent, boom, boom, and boom. So that's a good one. Make sure that you give them something legitimate in your business and that you're documenting it properly. And again, you speak with your professional and your professional will help you audit proof that strategy. But guess what? They want to go to the prom. They want to buy the new this or that. Hey, well, you know what? I tell my son, here's the box, go shred this and that. And then they come back and they earn, you know, you just make sure you document in a timesheet what they're doing. And then they're able to, you know, take that deduction, you pay them. And, you know, some professionals, you know, have different feelings about whether you have to issue a W-2 or not. But the more you treat them like an arm's length employee, the way you would anybody else, the better it is, the more credible it is and, and, and likely to, again, audit proof you. And, uh, but it's not, 100% necessary in some cases. I've, I've been on, uh, with a, I work with an attorney, a CPA who, a tax attorney, CPA, who also says you don't really have to do it. The W-2 doesn't prove they worked. All it does is report what happened. The timesheet is more substantial evidence that these children worked in your business. You can also, on a sole proprietor, hire your spouse. That's what um, gives you the eligibility to have the Section 105 plan. And it also saves money on FUTA. You don't have to pay FUTA on a spouse. You do have to pay FICA, which is Social Security and Medicare. But there are plenty of benefits in hiring a spouse as well. You can hire parents. So there are different things that you need to review and look at to make sure that you're doing the right thing. I'm going to pause for a second in case Safi wants to tell me something, questions coming up or, or anything like that. Just listen. No, all set, Angie. Uh, great information so far. Thank you. Great. So I'm not sure how long you want me to speak, but um, those are some things. And the plan is about figuring it out, right? We want to see, I want you to go through your Schedule A as well. Your Schedule A is looking for deductions that you, whenever you see a blank line, it's like, could I have taken that? You know, you want to make sure you haven't missed anything. One thing that I did catch on a couple of clients, some clients unfortunately had some issues on the state in the past on their state uh, returns and maybe owe the state. And I'm talking prior to 2018, before that SALT limitation got hit. Those are 100% deductible on your, in, in other words, it's not limited to that $10,000. So I found a couple of clients weren't telling me that they were paying up old uh, tax debt. And that, yes, that may, and, but you have to be itemizing, obviously, and be able to put it on that Schedule A. So those are things you also want to look at. When I've reviewed other clients, I've seen on a Schedule E. Schedule E is where you're reporting your rental property at, or your other supplemental income, such as an S Corp or a partnership income from a K-1. Those things are coming in on page two of your Schedule E. But I've seen issues where 
clients are deducting things incorrectly. <clears throat> That's part of tax planning as well. Either missed deductions or incorrectly deducted where, you know, we want to make sure they're doing it correct going forward. Because guess what? You're now avoiding penalties and interest if you get audited. So those are also uh, great strategies um, to save you on taxes. There are plenty having to do with your vehicle too. You want to make sure that you're taking your mileage properly. Now, the IRS has certain rules called strict substantiation. That means if you're audited and you took a deduction, you better be able to back it up to the penny. So mileage happens to be one of them. You want to get an app if you can through the year or some other way where you don't have to write it down and remember. But basically you take this mileage deduction, but I know people who are missing this, especially if you're a business owner. Some people are afraid, but I get it. You know, it, it can be sensitive and because it's strict, you want to make sure you're doing it correctly. But where they're missing is well, I'll give you an example. I have a physician client who has uh, several practices. He has about five different businesses or, or clinics where he goes. By making his primary or chief administrative office in his home, we just took away commuting because you cannot deduct commuting costs, meaning from here to the practice, back home to the practice. But if you make your primary administrative office in your home, you just got rid of commuting and that's a very nice deduction. It adds up. I'm telling you, it's uh, the IRS gives you a very nice rate if you're doing the standard, but there's also actual where you can depreciate the vehicle, et cetera. And then you also have to know about how to deduct the vehicle if you go the actual way, right? Is can you, you don't just write off the car payment. It doesn't work like that. We have to depreciate, et cetera. So again, it gets very complicated. So as a business owner, you have to recognize when you need a professional to help you. TurboTax is not going to cut it anymore. Okay. And I'm a fan. I'm a fan of do-it-yourself, self-preparers when it's a very simple. Because I find clients who have prepared themselves in the past, they're knowledgeable. And they, have, they ask uh, intelligent questions about their tax return because as a business owner, you do need to understand your tax return. Once you have that going for you, now you can say, all right, Staffy, here you go. I'm going to hire you to do my tax return because you know what? It's too complicated now. I have three businesses. I want to hire my kid. I got this rental property. I have this uh, rent, uh, vacation home I'm selling. And that's usually when people come, they come because they get an IRS notice and now they're afraid. But tax planning, again, is very critical to keep preserving your wealth, less for the IRS, more for you and your legacy. And if you're not doing planning, you are missing out. You're probably paying more taxes than you need to. And people who are not business owners, you're just W-2, there's plenty for you too. And maybe we'll just plant the seed to get you to start that side hustle because that side hustle is critical to in tax savings and building wealth. I wanna say that tax codes favor business owner. You're gonna hear me say that every time I speak and you listen to one of my presentations, I'm going to tell you that. And I'm gonna pause and maybe Safi can jump in. Perfect. Thanks so much, Angie. Great information. And you're right. Um, there's like so many more deductions um, for business owners and individuals. And, um, you know, not everyone's meant to be a business owner, but, if, you know, there's only but so much that can be done with wage earnings, wage earners. That's so, correct. But some wage earners own rental property and they don't think that that's a business, but there's plenty of strategy in there as well. Absolutely. It definitely is. And then, you know, different types of rent, you know, real estate industry, you know, you got rentals and you have the flippers and then you have, you know, the uh, developers. So there's so much um, expansion that could be done in that area. So definitely um, ways to even, you know, people who own investments, you know, there's ways to strategize with that. So if you are a wage earner there, there's hope for you too. But definitely if you add a business to that, it definitely increases um, the opportunity for planning. And, and, and there's so much, you know, that you could share, Angie. I want to thank you for sharing all those years of experience. And <laughs> happy birthday in advance. <laughs> thank you. 
So um, I'm not seeing any questions right now, but I do want to let people know that we are open for Q&A. Anything related to this topic or general tax and accounting type specific questions, feel free to go ahead and post that. I'm watching Facebook and Clubhouse. But um, I do want to, you know, kind of throw out there what you mentioned about the um, S corporations. I've been sending out my reminders right now. And um, number one, you know, the importance is that you are on payroll. And if you're not currently, there's still time to do that. There's even time left if you're not set up as an S corporation right now, a late election could be made if there's enough time to get your payroll set up and your reasonable comp paid out. There could be some significant tax savings this year still um, with that election in place, assuming you already have your entity set up already. So I wanted to put that out there. It's also the time to definitely connect with your payroll companies as, as far as the proper recording for the health insurance because uh, people are always scrambling like, you know, December 20th, 28th, <laughs> trying to get that corrected or have to get it corrected if it's been issued next year because you can't take the deduction. So, yes. So yes, let's accentuate partners. this. Let's tell the people that it is November 11th, a uh, 12th, <laughs> sorry, 12th, yes. 2021. And we are calendar year taxpayers, January 1st, 1231. And to Safi's point, if you have not moved the money that you need to move by 1231, you've lost the deduction, and especially you escort people. For example, if you have a home office and you would like to deduct that home office, you need to have set up an accountable plan where you're giving yourself, the shareholder and employee, the permission to work from home. You submit your expense reimbursement to the S Corp, it's nothing but a travel and entertainment expense that you would see in corporate America. And then when you do that, the S Corp now has the support to deduct the expense for office expense or however you wanna categorize it in your business, in your QuickBooks. You move the money out of the S Corp bank account and into the individual employee's bank account. It shows that it moved. It may seem stupid because you'll say like, well, I just paid a rent with it or no, it cannot go from your S corp to the, to the, to the landlord. It has to go into your personal bank account. If you don't do that by 1231, you've lost that money. And let me tell you, that is tax free money out of your business. Reimbursements we know are not taxed. So the reimbursement for your home, your cell phone, internet use, the home office space, all of that, and you need a professional to review your tax returns for tax planning purposes to make sure you haven't been missing those things in the past. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah, good points. And um, and even your mileage, you know, for those who are using their vehicle for um, business, if you're properly tracking your miles, that can also be a part of your home um, uh, accountable plan reimbursement. That's right. We said S Corp, but it's also C Corps because I do have a few C Corp clients who think, because people are always talking about S Corp, you need to do mm -hmm. the accountable plan is, but C Corps too. You need an yes. accountable plan. Yes. You need reasonable compensation set up, all of those things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great point. Now, what about partnerships? Because that's one that I've been kind of, so it's a great area. So partnership works similar to this to the sole prop, right? You can still do, you don't have to do that whole reimbursement thing, as it said, you can actually deduct that off mm -hmm. on a K-1. It'll come off and um, uh, as a good uh, deduction. Got it. Good uh, however, for employees, you're right though. For even sole proprietors, if we're talking about employees, if you're mm -hmm. the owner, you don't have to do it, but for got employees, it. you do have to do the accountable plan. Got it, got it. How do you handle when you have a partnership, two members not related? Uh, let's say both of them use their cars for business. Um, the company doesn't own not either car. So in that case, um, in, my, in the past, I have done accountable plans, you know, to submit the reimbursement to the partnership if the agreement states that the partnership can um, do those reimbursements. And if it doesn't, my understanding is they have to do the unreimbursed method on their person. Yes, the UBIA, right, correct. Yes. They are absolutely yes. right. That is how you do it. Hopefully that has been agreed upon with the partners that we will reimburse this. But mm -hmm. I, I often have people go, oh, I formed a multi-member LLC. I'm a partnership and they have no operating agreement. And they just willy nilly, oh, 50-50, 30, right. 30, 70, you know, any way they want. I said, oh, it doesn't work like that. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. Right. Yeah, perfect, perfect. All right, Angie, so that, that is great information, as I mentioned, and um, timely as we're heading towards the end of the year. We've got about six weeks left, believe it or not, before 2021 is over. Wow. 
we'll be into the next tax season and just finish one, you know, so um, proving to be another, you know, a different tax season, but hopefully better than the last two. So, um, you know, I'm going to have you share your information as we wrap up, but I'll just kind of close out for anyone who's joined us. And um, today we had guest speaker Andrew Tony sharing tax planning tips to reduce your taxes, you know, legally. And um, my name is Safi Russell, CEO and founder of SDR Consulting, Inc. You can find us online at SDR Consulting or by phone 516-255-6603. And Angie, I'm going to have you get, go ahead and close out. And thanks again for joining us today. Awesome. So I'm Angie Tony, Angel Financial Services, LLC. Uh, it's angelfinancial.services. You can look us up on the web and all my information is there on my social media. We do have a 24-7 answering service, 703-972-5777. Great. Perfect. All right. So everyone enjoy the rest of your Friday. Have a great weekend. We will be back next Friday with another guest speaker. So feel free to share with a friend. And um, later on, this will be posted to the podcast and on our YouTube page if you got, didn't get a chance to hear everything today. All right, everyone have a great weekend. Thanks again, Angie. Thank you. Good night. Bye-bye.